Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second in our 2023 webinar series on electrifying commercial fleets. I'm Nino DiCara, founder of Electric Autonomy, and I'm delighted to introduce this episode, How to Set Up Fleet Depot Charging Infrastructure, which is sponsored by ABB eMobility, BC Hydro, PowerOn, and Signature Electric. We're grateful to the teams at those organizations for their participation and support of this discussion. I'd like to acknowledge that our work at Electric Autonomy is conducted from the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Today, to help with your fleet electrification plans, we'll be covering the key steps to planning and installing depot charging, including how to create the budget, applying for grants, how to choose charging hardware, how to maximize power on site, and importantly, how to work with your utility. I'm grateful for the expert speakers today who know a huge amount about setting up charging infrastructure at Fleet Depots, and I'm delighted to introduce you to them now. They are Manib Durrani, Director of Sales, Transit and Fleet at ABB eMobility Canada. Jason Skoltetti, Senior Key Account Manager at BC Hydro. Isla Seed, Account Executive at PowerOn Solutions. Mark Marmer, Founder and Executive Director at Signature Electric. And my colleague, Ilana Weitzman, VP of Strategic Development at Electric Autonomy, who'll be moderating today's discussion. And with that, over to you, Ilana. Thank you, Nino. I want to share that this webinar series has emerged from our work at the EV Fleets Knowledge Hub, Electric Autonomy Canada's online course for fleet pros who want to take the first steps towards electrifying their fleets. If you haven't already, I encourage you to check it out after our session today at evfleets.ca. And the good news is that signing up is completely free. Um, I'm very excited about today's discussion, and I'm going to kick things off by asking all of our panelists a key question. What's the first step for a fleet looking to install charging stations at a warehouse or other fleet parking site? And we'll start with you, Manib. Thanks, Lana. I get to be the lucky one to go first. Um, so the first step that um, a fleet needs to do is basically identify how much time that they have available to be able to perform the charging because there are a lot of variables when it comes to picking the right charger. It could be kilowatts. It could be the type of strategy, whether it's sequential or parallel. So I would suggest the first thing is looking at your dwell time or which is basically the time that you have available to charge. That's great. Um, and I, I guess in terms of the time available to charge, just so that people understand that calculation, can you give us an example of a truck and a battery pack and then how that kind of works out mathematically? <laughs> Yeah, for sure. So basically, if you have a truck that has, let's just say, a 200 kilowatt hour battery um, and it's delivering uh, beverages to a bunch of restaurants around the city, um, you know that, let's just say, it leaves the truck, the depot around 8 a.m. and it comes back at 8 p.m. You'll have around, um, you know, from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. Again, it's around 12 hours to be able to charge your vehicle. Um, 200 kilowatt hours is the units that we have for a battery and that's how much energy that needs to be delivered over that 12 hour period of time. And the way that chargers work is that they use kilowatts as their rating. And typically a rule of thumb is that basically the amount of the rating of the charger, so let's just say it's 20 kilowatts per hour, you, you should be able to deliver 20 kilowatts in one hour. Therefore, to charge that truck of 200 kilowatt hours, if you have 12 hours available, you'll need a 20 kilowatt hour charger. Basically over that period of time, it'll work. But let's just say you only have two hours or one hour during lunchtime, then you need basically 200 kilowatt charger to be able to deliver approximately 200 kilowatt hours um, in an hour. So that's like a rough math. Back that's up great. The um, Mark, first steps for you. I, I'm sure it won't surprise you that I'm concerned about how much electricity is available at the site. So if we happen to have enough electricity, when it, Monique's right, we've got enough dwell time, we've got enough electricity to be able to manage the charger that we're putting, then this is a, a giant bonus for us. If we have it turns out we need more, which maybe mean an increase in the size of the service or a new service. These things have a can have a very long timeline on them, and we should be considering this when we're looking at the 
the purchase of the trucks and the delivery time for the chargers and what have you, because a lot of times these things uh, are not matching a, a sort of an expectation of when we expect everything to arrive. So being realistic about that uh, helps. And then uh, Jason, since we're talking about electricity as um, as our, our panelist from BC Hydro, um, I'd love to have you jump in. Yeah, thanks, Lena. I think I would add to Mark's comment to say there's no early time to engage your utility, start speaking to your utility right away uh, to really get ahead of that, especially if you are looking at potentially a new connection service. And I think one thing we advocate for with our customers is the, the really um, important need to do planning. So to do all that comprehensive analysis to understand which vehicles could be electrified in your fleet, and then what that means in terms of your infrastructure and electrical requirements. Uh, and so we really um, talk to our customers about early stage planning and analysis. And uh, Tyler, I know that's a great segue <laughs> uh, for, for your process as well. So what would be the first steps at power on when you're working with a client? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's there's not much, you know, not much that I would add to what uh, Mark Amonib said about at the site once you're there and sort of scoping out the uh, the electrical capacity and requirements, but just taking a step back, like Jason said, you know, often we'll, when we start talking with clients, they won't even know where to start. And so we're looking at an entire listing of all of their vehicles across all of their sites um, and really taking it from that very first step, seeing where you've got some capacity, what are the vehicles that are most ready to be retired or flipped over and, uh, and really starting from there so that we can develop a strategic plan. That's great. And, and Tyler, you know, we had um, a few questions from our audience around this um, about future proofing a site and balancing that upfront investment and future expansion and, and how do we play around with that. Um, so how do you help your clients approach future proofing their facilities and technologies? What are the most important factors to consider when planning EV infrastructure to allow for future expansion? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's something that we run into almost every time. Um, really, when you start scoping out a site, you're going to have choices to make in terms of, you know, what uh, with conduit, what size transformer, these sorts of things, how many chargers, of course, and, and how fast should those chargers be, and where we want to, you know, what parking spots to start at. And it's much easier to make those kind of decisions when you've got a strategic endpoint in mind for that site and for the entire fleet, rather than just sort of having to guess at it. Manib, I, I think coming back to this idea of how to plan for um, the charging hardware itself, which ties a little bit into what um, Tyler is saying is, you know, um, how does a company figure out what kind of charging hardware it needs in terms of kilowatt, AC versus DC for the vehicles it is planning to charge? Um, and even something as basic as, do you need the same number of stations as vehicles? These are the kinds of uh, questions we got in from our audience during registration. Yeah, <clears throat> there's a lot to unpack there, but uh, definitely AC versus DC, it's as simple as um, you know, saying that you, if you have a lot of um, dwell time or a lot of time available, um, AC is typically a little bit slower than DC, and DC is um, direct current, which goes directly into a battery, and that's typically how uh, a battery charges. When you do have an AC charger, at the end of the day, it does convert eventually into DC because the vehicle itself has an onboard converter, and then that goes into the, into the battery, but it is a limiting factor on every single vehicle. So that's the main difference between AC and DC. Um, on the other side, in terms of kilowatts, uh, like I mentioned before, you need to know basically the amount of time you have available and the kilowatts of the charger. Um, that kind of that's basically gives you a rough analysis on how you can determine the kilowatt rating. But at the end of the day, you made a very valuable point on how many vehicles do you have and do you really need one charger per um, vehicle? So nowadays, as the technology has been evolving, you necessarily don't need one charger per vehicle. You can actually have one charger serve multiple vehicles. Um, for there are strategies out there known as parallel and sequential charging and um, Initially, uh, actually the charger you can see on the background here in front of everybody is, has the capability to do parallel charging. And what that means is that basically when you pull up to a charger, and let's just say it's charging at 120 kilowatts, um, for the first vehicle, as soon as the second vehicle comes in, you'll be able to split the charge and do 60, char 60 kilowatts to each simultaneously. 
Now in the past, that was something that was completely unheard of. So traditionally, when we look at our, our, our traditional fueling methods and we go to a gas station and you have the choice between gas and diesel, you, know, you can't just pick up both and start charge, you know, fueling up two vehicles at the same time. Uh, but now with, with, with the electrical charging infrastructure, we can do that. Um, and so that's parallel charging. The second type is, let's just say if your vehicles aren't coming in, coming in at the same time, then you can have multiple dispensers for um, the specific charger that you have. So what that means is that let's just say you have a parking lot with four parking spots, you can put four different stations on each of each one of them that are connected to a single charger, and they will basically charge the vehicles as they come in in a, in a sequential manner. That means let's just say you have you know four trucks and you have a 150 kilowatt charger, you can have each of them connected up to four different vehicles, and then you'll have the first truck charge up until it's at a certain state of charge, then it'll switch over to the second, to the third, and so on and so forth. So that's the good. Um, Mark, let's let's flip over to you with some of the pitfalls or, um, you know, when you when you head out to a site to look at for, you know, to do an evaluation in terms of installation. Um, what are some of those uh, things to avoid learnings you've had that you can share with our audience? Sure. I, I think we're talking about all kinds of ideas so far about uh, bigger fleets and uh, multi campuses and a uh, hundred vehicles and sequential charging and dynamic load. There are we absolutely do have these kinds of installations. But frankly speaking, a lot of times we get there, they're getting one or two trucks. They want to try it out. They want to figure out how it's going to go. Can we? If we can just and they do. You know these things come with the price tag and the timeline. So they're you know they're interested. The trucks are. I, I get the trucks are coming in three months. So what can I do? And then I go to the panel and I see what the size of the service is. And I'll ask them, we were thinking about 175 kilowatt charger. Okay, that's interesting. So, but you know, uh, and we talked about even, uh, how are we gonna manage multiple vehicles? And I hear from uh, somebody that they'll say, well, this is a trucking company. I have people here 24 hours a day. You want me to move trucks around at night and put in one charger around? Happy to move them around. The guys are here, they're getting paid to do this anyways. I could care less. So if I save some money on a charger, that might make sense. So, okay, so this gives me choices. Then I go back, look at the service, look at the size of it. Turns out the breaker that I want to put in for 175 won't even fit in the panel because the panel's too old. So, you know, you're going to decide to tear out the whole panel? Probably not. So I don't know, like, I think it's a th this tricky piece is the hardest part. If we look at this as a big elephant and we want to just take a few bites at the beginning, see how see how it goes, and then, you know, look to expand from there. What are easy things to do are, I'm already digging up the parking lot, put in two more conduits when I did it. This is a, almost a no brainer. We literally, I would actually tell people that are paving a parking lot, and we have done this already for some fairly large customers, just throw the conduits in. You've got a $3 million paving job and I need $50,000 to throw some conduits in. The guys are already digging. It's like, it's like nothing. So, you know, we'll, we'll do that at the same time. So think about what things are reasonable. When you actually see a real customer, you won't see many of them anxious to spend uh, enough on a, you know, a, a megawatt of power and, uh, 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 you know, enough for 50 trucks at one time. They, they don't come along that often. Uh, I'm, Sure, Tyler will uh, agree. Does it? It's it doesn't happen uh, every time like that. So just find a simple and sensible way to get started. Yeah, I just wanted to say something adjacent to that, Mark. I mean, I completely agree with what you're saying there. And um, future proofing is really it's something that you should be looking at up front because adding the conduits, sizing your transformer right, right, that only has to be done once. You know, if you know you're going to start with two vehicles and then maybe go to five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten in the future, just get your conduits in, get your big transformer in. Because you, you don't want to do that twice. It's just going to be too long and it's going to be too expensive. But at the end of the day, if it does end up being expensive on the on the hardware side of things, there are a lot of options for CapEx available for you know the deep term charging as a service. But we'll get into that later. Yeah, there's no question. Once you've committed yourself to come some kind of service upgrade, you do have to make some kind of decision. Putting in a little service now and a bigger one later, this is not going to work. Time won't It won't work for time and it won't work for, for cost. And it may not work for physical space. Jason, what uh, recommendations do you make um, when when fleets are looking at this and uh, they they sort of want to they want to do this mindfully, reduce their risk, um, and uh, really avoid some of those pitfalls? 
Yeah, I think I'll stress again that, you know, it's really important to engage your utility early on in this process, even if you've done some type of assessment that says, look, I don't need new connection service, that's okay. I mean, often the utility can offer you other things in terms of resources, uh, opportunities for funding in your jurisdiction. There's other things that we can come to the table with, right? Um, if you do need new connection service, that early engagement is really key because it can be really lengthy. It can be a complex process. And it's best to start having conversations with us early to get ahead of that. Uh, if you're looking at a planned phased approach, like Mark said, um, like Monib said, then you know you can really look at what's the lead time to bring in new service to support that expansion of that fleet project. What does that look like? And really that early engagement with your utility, we can help you identify what those requirements look like and get your team ahead of that so that um, when you are faced with a new design service, uh, connection service, uh, you're prepared, you're ready, and that, that whole process can be much more efficient. Yeah, that kind of gets us into the timing question, which I, I'm, I'm going to turn to you, Tyler. But I, I like that idea, Jason, is that you may want to um, do some pilot work within you know, the, a certain capacity and then um, right away start talking to your utility about your expansion plans at the same time so that while your pilot is running, you're already in the design work process. Um, but Tyler, talk to us a little bit about timing. I know that's a big concern for you and really managing expectations around that. Yeah, absolutely. There are uh, there are a lot of sort of chicken and egg problems with uh, with some of these projects. I mean, you know, sometimes you talk to people, they've already ordered their vehicles. The vehicles are on their way and they need chargers right away. And there are lead times for, you know, not just the chargers, but for things like transformers and panels, of course. Obviously, there are there are huge lead times on the vehicles too. You don't want the chargers installed a year before you get the vehicles on site. And then, of course, there's the funding consideration. We've got the you know, the Zebip funding is is the most obvious one there for uh, for most types of fleets. There's uh, zero emission transit funding as well for school bus fleets and transit fleets, but for most, it'll be the Zebip funding for now. And um, yeah, the you know the past round of that, the lead time was I think it was somewhere around eight to 10 months between when people submitted their applications and they got word back. So that's a long time for, you know, you to find out whether you've got that funding and for things like uh, inflation to start to creep in and, and raise costs. There are, I would mention, a number of um, third party uh, delivery organizations, mostly nonprofits that are designated to help deliver those uh, Natural Resources Canada Zero Emission uh, 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 infrastructure funds to organizations for smaller projects, especially. And they're a little faster. And um, I want to get into the nitty gritty uh, of some of this stuff um, around uh, charger maintenance and how you keep things in good working order. Um, and also how you sort of think of um, some of the obvious, not obvious stuff. Um, Mark, I wonder if you can talk about some of the really good practices you've started to put in place to keep those chargers in, in good working order. Sure. It, uh, this, this is a challenging piece because, again, everything comes with a cost. So who's paying the cost and where is that happening? So the, the easier thing is, the like, the, like we see in the background, these DC fast chargers, they have a whole maintenance schedule that goes with it. I'm sure if I contacted AB, I know if I contacted ABB, they'd be able to send me the schedule for the next five years for that charger. And frankly speaking, these things can't really be avoided. Uh, there's filters that need to be changed and things of that nature. If you're not taking care of it, uh, it's not going to be reliable. Uh, it, it's helpful if it's on somebody's property. They do tend to take better care of it. It's it's critical when it doesn't work. They know immediately it doesn't work, as opposed to the public chargers. But there's all kinds of little things we don't think about. I'll, I'll just give you an example of, uh, we had a, a site where we put in uh, for, they were for vans and things, uh, last mile delivery, uh, 15 uh, 80 amp level two chargers. So pretty straightforward. We put them on the, uh, beside the doors and we put retractors in. And frankly speaking, the chargers were working fine. We were having trouble with the retract. Well, they weren't exactly working fine. They had some background issues, but the retractor was causing a problem that with the, there was getting so much use, more use than we were used to, that sometimes the cables were breaking. So the cable on the, the little piece of string broke, the cable ended up on the ground, and uh, the snowplow took the cable and the charger right off the wall. 
So, you know, again, nobody's looking at that. Who's who's assigned even to go once every few months and actually look to see are things working? Are they in place? Has a, has a cable got a nick in it? Has somebody driven over something and they just stopped using it? So you have to think about whether you can, it should be part of the whole planning process. The maintenance is at the end, but I think a lot of times it gets forgotten. That's helpful. Um, Jason, in terms of, you know, we managing, um, we, we've talked a little bit about capacity, but we haven't talked too much about demand charges and how that plays into planning. I wonder if you could, you could chat us through that. Yeah, I think, you know, it's important to understand your utility rates as well. So uh, every month, depending on your service size and your rate class, you could pay a, a demand charge on your peak consumption or your peak power required for that site. So you can imagine fleet electrification can add quite a bit of uh, peak load uh, to your to your location, right? Um, so it's, again, key thing to kind of engage with your utility. We do have fleet electrification, electrification rates at BC Hydro where we're trying to help customers shift to our off-peak periods and we'll help support that through the rate. Um, often other utilities have similar rates to help shift that peak uh, uh, load to up their off-peak grid system loads. Um, ours and BC, as an example, are usually in the evenings, you know, between 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. when everybody's come home from work and, and making dinner and things like that. So our fleet electrification rates are looking at overnight charging uh, specifically uh, to help shift that peak requirement. Um, but, you know, there's lots of things you can do in terms of managed charging to figure out how to properly manage your fleet charging requirements to make sure you're minimizing that peak requirement uh, and leveling out the charging sufficiently to support your fleets when they're in operation. I, yeah. I would just add to that, that oftentimes your, your electrification infrastructure provider can help you out with that energy management piece and, and planning the operations there as well. Yeah, Tyler, I was about to ask you about, um, we, we do have an audience question about um, managed charging and how it supports fleet savings um, and uh, load demand. Uh, can you chat us through some of the existing solutions for load management? Um, and it, the question actually asked when using different brands of EV charges, but if you could explain a little bit of the protocol and how that stacks, and then Manib, you might want to jump in as well. <laughs> Sure. And I mean, Maneeb started to touch on it earlier with the discussion about sequential charging, for example, that's one uh, technique to keep your to keep your demand down. I mean, in general, the, the name of the game is to try and generally keep as flat of a demand as possible throughout your charging time. So that's why you're wanting to start by understanding what the dwell times of the vehicles are. Uh, so that you can figure out what that sort of like optimal rate of uh, charging is going to be and stretch your charging out generally overnight for as long a period of time as possible. There are some other, you know, games you can play sometimes uh, in certain jurisdictions like Ontario with uh, global adjustment and, and a bit, uh, global adjustment abatement and using your energy management system for that. Um, that would be for more sort of a larger Kind of installation um, with some larger installations as well. You can utilize battery storage to help flatten those peaks out and your energy management system should be able to tie the whole thing together. Sometimes people are using solar as well. Um, there are a bunch of different ways you can you can flatten these things out and like I say working with your infrastructure provider with your utilities you, you can start to create a strategy that's not going to interfere with your operational needs. Yeah, just a layer on top of that on energy management as well. Um, there's a few few other strategies you can utilize as well because you're not just because you have 10 chargers or five chargers in your in your in the field, you're not they're all they're all not going to be plugged in at the same time. So um, what you could do is you can actually move the energy around using a third party energy management software. Um, that can be, there's a lot of different companies out there that are provided and they, they talk to the charger using OCPP. Uh, so for example, let's just say you only have 200 kilowatt hours of, um, uh, of energy or 200 kilowatts of energy available and you've got 10 chargers. Well, the four, the first four um, trucks or vans that come in, they can take 50 kilowatts each. And then as you keep, you know, it's, um, as you keep adding more vans that are coming to park in, then you can keep dividing that by the number of vans. So that's another strategy to keep the same grid uh, power and then maximizing the output for each specific charger. 
Um, yeah. That's great. Um, now out to the whole panel about a minute each to answer. And it's a really big question, which is, uh, We've had a lot of questions around what I call ballpark costing. I know every single site is different and all of you will say that, but um, Mark, let's start with you. What kinds of costs should fleets anticipate just for the electrical evaluation on the site? Okay, so this is a, thank you. That's a little bit of an easier question. So let's assume that you 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 wanna go there and you'd like to, you know, uh, we're thinking we need a new service. I mean, we're not quite sure, but we think we need a new service. So what's going to happen? So figure a couple of, uh, you've got to fill out a form with your utility. So different utilities are handled this slightly differently, but they do want information. They want to understand why you need an upgrade uh, and uh, what you think you're going to be doing over the next five years. They want to understand, they want to make sure that you're actually serious about doing this. So that could call it maybe $1,500, $2,000 to do the uh, background work and have the, you'll need an engineer probably to help you fill out the form. In, and every jurisdiction is not the same, but here at that point, you're gonna reach out to the utility and they're gonna say, okay, well, we have to look at our equipment in the area and decide if it can handle this. And we, we, we need to engage our engineers on our end and we would like some money for that too. So we want maybe another $5,000. So, which is, it's, I'm not suggesting in any way this is unreasonable. And then the $5,000 in the event that you went ahead with the project would just be simply be part of the project. And if you didn't, the people got paid for their time. This this is a complex thing that happens. So you could be, before you even know whether you can even have the service that you want, you could be $7,500 into the hole or $10,000. So I, that kind of, I, I can answer because we see this fairly regularly. Um, Manib, uh, what about the hardware? What should fleets anticipate for AC versus DC? What kind of costs are we? Yeah, doing? I'll give you general like industry pricing. In general, we're, we're staying around a thousand dollars per kilowatt. So let's just say it's a twenty kilowatt charger. You're probably going to pay around twenty thousand dollars. But there's a lot of different variability that comes with it. Um, obviously, with buying or purchasing uh, in volume or doing the installation and all these other things can play a factor. Um, but typically that's what we're seeing in the, in the industry itself. Um, Tyler, what about installation, construction, all of that side of things? <laughs> it's like a very big range, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we already we already talked quite a bit about future proofing and some of the decisions around that. And, and Mark spoke to service upgrades. So, you know, we've spoken quite a bit about the sort of larger scale type of projects. Um, I think, you know, I would add like on your first kind of pilot, like Mark was alluding to earlier, some of the general rules of thumb would be like, you know, if you're just installing a few chargers within the existing service that you have, you'd like to keep them as close as possible as you can to your electrical room. Um, you know, being along the outside of a parking lot, if you can, instead of somewhere in the middle where you have to trench to across, uh, across pa a paved lot. Um, Disruptions around not disturbing operations. So, Dia, is can can the work be done during regular hours, or are you going to have to be paying uh, for off hours work? I'm sure you know all of us are quite experienced in being as you know, not disruptive as possible in a, in an operational environment. But sometimes there is work that just can't be done during the workday. Um, so, you know, those are some of the cost things to keep in mind, and then. And then operations and maintenance going forward. If it's level two chargers, there's not going to be much of that. But like Mark said, if you're moving up to level three chargers, or if you have, you know, one or more of those for a certain number of vehicles, then there are scheduled maintenance that, that needs to be applied to that as well. And Jason, um, Mark touched a little bit on utility costs um, on that side. It would be great if you could expand on that and also just what you're seeing from projects in BC, um, where people are doing kind of their their first phase one, and what those costs are looking like? Yeah, sure. I mean, Mark does speak very accurately to the realities of bringing in new service. There are costs associated with that. You do have to apply. There's an application process and deposits required to do that in order for our teams to basically go and effectively design what that new service looks like. Um, depending on the utility, what we're trying to do is really get ahead of that by providing some preliminary review outside of that design process. So we can take a look at your project scope, give you a sense of whether, you know, the circuit that's adjacent to your facility can support the additional loads, 
maybe even look at what that scope looks like. Um, we can maybe advise on simpler connection points to help reduce the overall uh, system costs, right? Uh, based on what we have available in your area. And so again, like I, I hate to keep stressing it, but I will. Uh, it's really about that early engagement with utility, having the conversation, uh, just have it to see where they can provide you in terms of advanced sort of scoping exercises as well. Yeah. Sorry, there was a second part to your question, Elena, and I forgot what it was. Oh, if you're looking at some projects that um, you've seen that have used, you know, best practices in BC, if you have any examples of sort of a cost from one of those projects, just to give people a sense of, of an overall bird's eye view. Yeah, I, I mean, again, every it is quite snowflake-like projects, right? Every project's quite a bit different. Where we're seeing a lot of success in the commercial trucking sector would be where an organization has done that proper planning and study to really understand uh, the potential uh, scope of what their work looks like. And then they're phasing their approach, right? So the first phase could be, I'll make it up, but it could be three trucks on existing service. They put in the chargers. In the meantime, they're working with us to scope out the expansion of that whole fleet service and looking at maybe 10 to 15 or 20 trucks uh, for future deployment. And so we can work in parallel along with that first phase of their pilot testing. Um, as they start to operationalize those trucks, we can start to build on the infrastructure. And so it's really about that sort of planned uh, approach, really foundation of good analysis and study work done up front. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to save time for audience, audience questions. Uh, we had a fantastic response um, during the registration process. So I just want to quickly touch on uh, a few of those questions, and then we'll get into um, some of the live questions uh, from this webinar. So we had a um, couple of questions on V to G, which is uh, vehicle, vehicle to grid. Um, what is the status of V to G in regards to depot charging, and is it viable at this point? So I, I don't really think, so far the, the V to G so just to be clear, if somebody doesn't understand that, it's talking about taking the power from the battery and putting it in the, in the case where you say G means you're sending it to the grid. This is an extremely complex process because the uh, the utilities have very clear concern about when energy is going back. But it could be vehicle to the building is a possibility. So, you know, where you're trying to uh, manage this global adjustment, there's an enormous opportunity here because a global adjustment charge in, say, a large Class A building could be so much that even a, a small arbitrage will make a phenomenal difference and help to pay for the equipment. That kind of uh, pilots are the ones that we're involved in at the moment. Um, you know, but you take that right down to the Ford F-150, where Ford, not happening in Canada yet, by the way, is promising that you'll be able to charge your car from your house from your car. So this is a Call it V to H. We have this Vita question so that we can manage all these different things. So that being said, most of the vehicles that are most of the bigger trucks and stuff that are coming out will have the capability. It's partly also have to have, have the capability in the vehicle as well. So they will have the capability. And I'm positive that this will this and batteries will be a part of the ongoing uh, future that we're going to see. But we're still at an early stage. Keep in mind, it hasn't been that long since we've actually seen these trucks available for, for sale and, and the trucking firms being able to, to put them out. So we're still at an early stage, but some very interesting things happening and keep an eye on some of the, the, the different pilots that are happening. Yeah, I, I agree with everything Mark just said. I mean, it's super cool. Um, and, uh, and we've been involved in some pilots as well using um, Nissan Leafs, for example, with, uh, with bi-directional charging. Like Mark said, not true vehicle to grid for grid services, but vehicle to building uh, to mitigate those global adjustment uh, costs. And like it, it works, Te on a technical level it works, but it's kind of like on its own, it's probably not enough to make a business case necessarily. It's more about like finding layers of value from the vehicles and the chargers and putting it all together and seeing what can make the most sense. I think like school bus vehicle to building in Ontario with global adjustment where you've got school buses that are typically available during summer months, which are typically the big global adjustment peaks and, and sort of the school uh, schedule 
you know, delivery and drop off times being offset from what are typically those global adjustment peaks, but that's a very specific use case to Ontario. Yeah, and I also love the idea of these electric school buses going and acting as generators where they're needed. Yeah, just go find a place to park them for the summer, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, speaking of summer, we've had a, quite a few questions about solar and um, installing charging infrastructure on remote sites where a microgrid might be needed, such as solar and battery. Um, you know, how does this kit go together between uh, solar battery charging either on a remote site or just, you know, as a load management strategy? It would be great to hear about both of those uh, tactics. Yeah, um, I, I can say that, like, particularly with some of our larger transit projects, which is a lot of what we do at Power On, we end up, you know, a lot of these facilities are, it's not just about the charging, it's like turning the site into a whole microgrid being controlled by the energy management system with, with battery storage on site to help manage the demand charges and with, um, and, and sometimes with solar to also help with that. Um, you know, I think it's, I think it's at this point, probably more about, um, about an organization's desire to decarbonize as much as possible than it is like a pure business case kind of play, but, you know, absolutely. And, and it does help with the resiliency aspect of things. You just need to make sure you've got the space for it. Yeah. I think space is a good point. Just, I think people are under the impression that if I have a building and I'll just put some panels up and that will be really helpful. And I will use that. They're just, the it's just out of scope. The, if you would see how many panels it might actually take, you would need like a whole TTC yard filled on the top of the whole thing. And that might do something. My, I have the top of my roof on one side is completely filled with panels and it can barely manage even to keep up the load of my, my house and my, you know, my one or two electric vehicles. So it, it actually doesn't keep up. So you, you just, these are for that piece of it is, you know, for a bigger installation. And, but listen, no, we're not against Tyler and I are neither of us against the idea of doing things that are good for the environment. And we're, I'm sure believers in, in solar is a, a, a useful thing, a little, a little here, a little there, and it all adds up. Absolutely. Um, I have a question here around um, approvals. And <laughs> this is a great question. What's the chain of approvals from uh, property, city, province, uh, even potentially federal entities? Really open question. Jason, um, maybe maybe starting with you on this one. Yeah, I, well, I mean, if you're talking about funding approvals, they're all over the map, to be honest with you, right? So it depends on project milestones. Typically, funding program offers are pre-approval first before work begins and so you have an agreement with that funding authority you advance the work and then usually the rebate or incentive is provided once the work is complete that's typically the structure here in bc for sure um, aside from that you know engaging with the utility going through a design process for a new service your designer that's assigned to that project will help you with all the approval requirements uh, but there are, could be property agreement referral, the, uh, things that need to be accommodated right away agreements could be have to be navigated. Um, if you are looking at crossing public land, then there's, you know, permitting and, and agreements with uh, municipalities as well. Uh, and so there's a whole bunch of things that could come into play when you're looking at bringing in a new service. Uh, but typically your utility can help you guide through that permitting process and those requirements as well. And what about, uh, uh, Mark, uh, I, I'm going to turn to you on this one, um, ESA inspections, we actually have a very specific question, which is, when you're throwing extra conduit under that pavement, <laughs> how does it work with the ESA inspection? I, uh, kudos to the ESA, so just to be clear, to the ESA is the Electrical Safety Authority, that's who does inspections here in Ontario. Uh, kudos to them. This is the easiest thing for us. I can literally, if I... It, I got to be careful what you're talking about. If you're talking about a large duck bank, it might need some pre-planning. But if I was putting some conduit in the ground and I wanted to put it in this week, if I took out a permit right now, told the inspector I'd like them there on Friday to take a look at it, and there would be no problem. This really is the 
e easier part of it. You know, we have a very large upgrade going now for uh, somebody that bought a factory, not, nothing to do with EV charging, but it needed a large upgrade. And uh, as we worked our way through the process, what it turned out was the pad mount transformer was over a year away. So how are we going to manage with the existing service as the you know they're bringing in their equipment and we've got the duct bank going in now and the 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 concrete for the pad mount transformers in and now we're looking at if you would take a slightly smaller transformer you could have it a little sooner so tons of decisions uh, I would say the ESA is the easiest part like a commercial for the ESA there huh <laughs> nicely done uh, we'll have to get them as a sponsor for the next one for sure for sure. <laughs> um, uh, Maybe, Maneeb, this one is for you. Um, station data connectivity uh, and technology considerations. Uh, are stations pre-equipped with LTE, 5G, Wi-Fi? Um, what is there by default and how do you manage the connectivity piece? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, connectivity is very important. I mean, you want to be able to, as a fleet operator, see what's going on with your chargers without actually having to go outside and physically see them, right? You want to be able to see them on your laptop or cell phone or tablet or whatever you're using these days. Um, most of our, actually all of our DC chargers have um, cellular connectivity. So um, right now they're using um, a SIM card in it, which typically runs on the LTE 4G networks. Uh, some of the older ones are on 3G. Uh, we don't have 5G yet, but obviously it should be coming as the technology keeps evolving. Um, and on the AC side, it's all Wi-Fi. So to be, you need to be able to connect to Wi-Fi or hard ethernet into the charger to be able to see them um, back on your computer. So, uh, Alana, can, I, can I poke in for a sec? Just, Absolutely. <laughs> so just to be clear, one of the things that we'll do is uh, we will do testing uh, to make sure that there actually is sufficient signal. We can do this in advance and actually confirm exactly which signals they are and, and which is best because uh, you, once you get into a big installation, you will find out we have sometimes uh, installations that turn out to be by a lake. And it turns out because it's by the lake, there's really not very good connectivity at all for um, for cellular so that that would be a real concern that being said we can look at it and uh, sure money will tell you we could hardwire it in other ways and find another way to get the signal but it's good to know this ahead of time the other thing is that i mentioned earlier about the 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 80 amp uh, uh ac chargers that this is not an unusual uh arrangement these 80 amp chargers are becoming very popular uh, it's a relatively economical way to do it. So they're OCPP, they're using a back end. They will need some kind of connectivity. They will likely each need to be programmed in some way. The back end, whether it's uh, it's getting it through uh, cellular or Wi-Fi, will need to be pointed one to the other. There's just a lot more than what you see uh, when you see the little charger on the uh, on the wall. And uh, just, just to be aware that you really need to be dealing with somebody who understands these pieces, or you're going to come up to a problem and say, oh, I didn't I didn't think I was going to need Wi-Fi connection, or, or I didn't understand that these had to be programmed, or there's some kind of child parent arrangement that had to be made, and it should have been done in the shop. Now we're standing out in the cold in the snow with a laptop trying to figure it out, uh, you know, and, and then connecting with which back end did we decide on, because that's the whole purpose of OCPB is to have other choice of back end. So how does this back end provider interact with this chart? You can see just there's a lot of pieces to it. Somebody with experience will help you with this. And uh, and I would just add, I see some, I think that this discussion is relevant to one of the questions that came through in the chat here, which was about a separate dedicated meter to track kilowatt hours dispensed for carbon credits. So not familiar with all types of carbon credits myself, but at least for the new clean fuel standard credits, you don't need a separate dedicated meter. It's the important thing is that you have smart chargers that are networked, that are on a network so that you can capture that data in the back end. They can and be that's on what Intercan's been using all this time to collect the data for, for years already. As long as it was connected, then then you they would accept that data. So you're limiting yourself if you like dumb chargers are slightly cheaper, but you're limiting yourself in, in the ways that you can report and, and collect data and, and credits and whatnot. Yeah, it's a good and just to, just to piggyback off that, to close uh, the credits topic here as well, actually, as of today, you can continue to uh, collect credits. Uh, you won't get, you know, um, rewarded for it yet, but you can start collecting the data. So as of, you know, April 24th, um, or I think it was a couple of weeks before, the we any charging that you do use in Canada can be used for further whenever the, the uh, standards come up. Now we're getting uh, again a group of questions about strategies when power at the site is limited, um, old infrastructure, 
uh, limiting the ability to add charges. What are some paths forward other than, you know, as we can imagine, sort of uh, getting the, the the big guns in from the utility? What are some things that people can do on a site like that? So, I mean, one of the easy things to do, and it doesn't always work for a fleet, is power management. We, we talked about it in you know, just various terms, but there's all kinds of ways to power manage things. So to, to lower it down, the problem sometimes with power management is you just don't have enough time. Ultimately, at some point or other, these trucks have to be charged and they have to leave in the morning. There's a business that needs to be done. So how is that going to happen? I'll, I'll tell you what we have, what's interesting out in the field. And again, we're still early with some of this stuff. We have a supplier that's putting char public chargers into uh, grocery stores. Uh, so a few chargers and they have a battery on the back of it. So the battery is doing the uh, helping for the global adjustment, but the battery is also helping to provide backup for the refrigeration in the uh, stores. So the stores, well, they're, it's nice to have the chargers. They like that idea. Uh, but what they really like is the idea that they got suddenly backup for the, uh, for their uh for their refrigeration, which is absolutely critical to them. And then if I start to do the math on how it works in terms of this, this bit of arbitrage for the, the global adjustment, the whole thing, even at even at two or three times the price, is starting to make sense. And then we can all and the, and frankly speaking, the chargers end up being like a a minor thing. We'll put a we'll put a note on the screen right now that the charges are either off or reduced because we're using the energy for something else. It doesn't happen all that often, but you know, compare that to the possibility of having, which they don't do, having an on-site generator or having to bring a generator on when something goes wrong. The even if it's even if it only manages them for an hour, a couple of hours. I think some of this technology is going to work its way into other areas. Uh, it's just a tricky to find the right customer and the and and at the right cost and and what have you so you know all you would asked about solar and you asked about battery and all kinds of other possibilities this is just a very interesting possibility and it's working quite well some of the other uh, grocery stores are starting to take up on it both here in Canada and the US and and uh, so they've got a good target customer right and proven out and and it's reliable by the way in terms of, in terms of charging it does a very nice job yeah, those are very cool. Um, uh, and I would just like, so they're just, I would just add to what Mark was saying that they're able to charge themselves like the battery at a very slow speed from the, from the service. And then, and, but they can discharge a fast charge often. A lot of these, uh, these new charger models. Yeah, I got a little excited. So I forgot to mention this because so, <laughs> what happens of course, is the grocery store only has so much power and they have zero intention of increasing the size of their service. So if somehow I can manage just 200 amps to this, I can, you know, a little bit like your toilet, right? I'll fill it when I have time and dump it out when I when I need it, and then I'll fill it again. Uh, you're right, I Tyler. I missed out on almost the most one of the most important things since I got excited about the other part of it. Mark, I prefer the water tank to the toilet, but now I have a whole new Sorry visual. That. I, that we'll we'll have this uh, this <laughs> this continental discussion at another time. <laughs> um, Question here about cold weather. So you've got your vehicles outside charging uh, during cold weather. Does that change things? Do we need to worry about this? We are Canadian. Okay, so nobody here is making vehicles, but I have three electric vehicles. Uh, I, I, it's usually what's happened, it's become much, much, this cold weather thing was a bit of an issue uh, way back when, when the batteries were relatively small, the battery management systems weren't all that good. And, uh, you know, if you, if you only have a hundred, uh, we'll talk about a car for a moment, but if you only have a hundred or 150 kilometers and you lost 20% of that, suddenly this is a real problem. But if you get into my car where you've got 600 kilometers of range and you lost 20%, well, who cares? So, uh, you know, it's not, and in terms of the charging, which you, you asked about, the car understands it's cold. It preconditions the battery to uh, accept it. And as long as I have enough time for all that activity to take place, it, it's not an issue. So I wouldn't be, it's a bit of a red herring because uh, we've been hearing about it for, for so long, but I wouldn't think it's a, a, a giant thing to worry about. And But, you know, this is, do this in the analysis at the beginning. The The vehicle manufacturers understand their vehicles very well. They understand their charging systems. Tell them what you're doing with them. Tell, be realistic about your dwell time and, and let them figure out what, what's going to make sense. They don't want to sell you a vehicle that's not going to work well for your for your, uh, for your your business because how's that going to benefit them? 
Yeah, and another recommendation on cold temperature is to check from your hardware supplier, like how, uh, what these chargers are rated to, right? So for example, us, we go to minus 35, right? We designed our chargers with heaters, insulation and everything just so they're, they can last in cold climates. But let's just say, what, what do you think happens at minus 40, minus 50, right? So there is a, um, a D rating that happens. So let's just say you have a 100 kilowatt charger. Um, as it gets colder, you want to start protecting some of the electronics. Instead of getting 100, maybe you'll get 80 or, not, or 60 or 50 kilowatts out of it. So you're going to try to protect the components, but still be able to deliver some somewhat of a charge. The other thing is, I, I, Maneeb, I'm not sure, but we could we could keep the main charging unit separate from the from the dispensers. And it's possible that if we needed to warm that a bit because we had a really severe location, I presume that's a possibility. Now, that is a possibility, absolutely. But again, it's going to come down to this chain, right? It's going to be a limiting factor. Most likely will be either the battery or the connector or the, you know, whatever we see there. So um, all of it, just because your charger is rated to a certain temperature doesn't mean that your vehicle is going to be able to withstand that, right? So um, you got to look at everything in, in, the, in the chain and then see where the weakest point is and, and work, work way backwards from there. Um, we have some questions around um, companies offering maintained charging infrastructure for level two chargers. So really, uh, I guess that means charging as a service. Maybe we can dip into that and what that means a little bit, because all these this discussion about costs can be quite intimidating. <laughs> yeah, um, I saw that one as well. I mean, Power on offers charging as a service. So, so there's that. Uh, basically, like when we talk about charging as a service, talking about a turnkey charging solution. So all the infrastructure and everything you need planned out um, and then financed and set to like a fixed, let's say monthly or annual payment over a set period of years. And that's what we call charging as a service. For some larger uh, fleets and larger projects, we can add on to that what we're calling energy as a service, which would add sort of like a fixed electricity cost, uh, depending on the project. And keep in mind that there's businesses that are doing this with everything, the vehicles, the chargers, the installation, the maintenance, the planning, all of this, put this, because this is how companies work, you know, so show it to me, show it to me in kilometers, or dollars per kilometer, and that's how I figure out whether I'm making money or not, and it costs me this much to keep a diesel truck, they don't not particularly interested in owning the trucks or fixing anything, they want to know what their monthly costs are, then they can plan their business. So there are companies that are doing this and doing it fairly well, but it is a, it, there is a learning curve to it. There's a couple of questions in here around sort of predicting demand. Um, is there sort of a, a, a good scratch way of going, you know, I've, I, I, I know I'm gonna hit demand charges and I've got to factor that cost into my EV charging. So, I don't know, Jason, maybe this is a question for you. Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely usually utilities have a rate calculator that can help you work through what those cost impacts would look like based on the projections of what your demands might be, uh, what the demand might be. Um, again, you know, I think different utilities might offer specific rates to help reduce that for fleet electrification projects. Uh, so that's a consideration as well. And actually it ties into a comment earlier about separate metering. That's something to discuss with your utility too, because if there are special rates, often they do require separate metering. So something to consider if you're looking at specific fleet electrification rates through your utility as well. Yeah. And keep in mind, if you're trying to reduce demand charges, one of the things you can do is put enough hardware on to be able to understand when the demand charge is going to kick in. That being said, you have to decide at that point, what are you going to do? Stop charging your trucks? That may not be reasonable uh, and you may not have many other tools to work with, but it's possible or, you know, could be could we manage if it was reduced? Uh, you know, it, again, we have a bit of a cost benefit, but ultimately the problem is these trucks do have to leave in the morning. So uh, we always always like to focus back to we want to talk about char cars and trucks and chargers and everything. But don't forget, there was a business here. The business needs to run. This can't this has got to be a benefit to the business, not interfere with the business. And, and when you don't have necessarily that flexibility of operations and your demand and the demand charges really start to hurt, then that's when you might start looking at things like battery storage and Absolutely. whatnot to help offset those things. Yep. Definitely. That start, starts to make economic sense, right? Yep. 
That's great. And I think that, the, you know, the big learning there is to think about this as a phased approach and to think about this as a system you're building over time as you bring more and more vehicles. I think everyone has to remember this doesn't really happen overnight. It's uh, it's kind of a roadmap and a journey. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, that that was a fantastic discussion. Um, and with that, we've wrapped the Q&A segment of today's session. Um, before I hand back to Nina to tell you about some more exciting events we have planned, um, I just want to thank everyone. You've been fantastic. Thank you, Monib, Jason, Tyler, and Mark for all your time and expertise today. And a big thank you to you, Ilana, for moderating the, the discussion. And a uh, huge thanks to our audience. We had well over 300 people register for this uh, session today. We know it's highly in demand. And uh, I'm incredibly grateful to all the speakers who've uh, generously shared their knowledge and expertise today. Uh, Jason, Tyler, Mark and Muneeb, um, I really appreciate that. I'm just sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but we will share the questions that we haven't answered with the panelists um, at, who will be able to follow up with you directly. Um, big thank you once again to our sponsors, ABB eMobility, Signature Electric, PowerOn and BC Hydro. Um, not just for bringing expertise forward today, but also for sponsoring this event and being great partners in the evfleets.ca knowledge hub. When it comes to electrification, electric autonomy has got you covered. Uh, visit evfleets.ca for learning modules that will take you all the way through the steps of electrifying your fleet from A to EV, as we like to say, um, with quizzes and tests and a certification at the end for fleet managers who want to go through that process. We will be announcing more webinars in the coming weeks, so keep your eye on Electric Autonomy's newsletter. But finally, if you are able to make it to Toronto on May 17th and 18th, we'd love to welcome you to the EV and Charging Expo. You'll have a chance to meet many of the speakers on the panel today, along with many other experts and vendors who can help enable your fleet EV transition. Uh, it is a major event where you'll be able to test drive commercial electric trucks and delivery vans, and look at various op options of charging hardware and charging networks. We think you'll get a lot out of the event and um, we hope to see you there. Thanks for joining us today and see you in the next one.